Well, hello, friends and family in the Messiah. This is Philip Shields. Warm greetings to all of our dear Heavenly Father, Yahweh, and our husband-to-be, Yeshua, the Messiah, Jesus the Christ, and to all of you who are in the Christ. This is Philip Shields with the second part on healing. I really don't want to discuss every aspect of healing, but you might think I'm beginning to, as there are so many things, in fact, to talk about. And But I want to talk to you primarily, especially the last half of this message, on why it is that we're not seeing more dramatic, instant, verifiable, and powerful, stunning healings than we've ever seen before. Please don't misunderstand me, brethren. I, I, I'm not saying that we're not seeing any healings, or that God isn't healing at all today. I'm not saying that at all. I know God is alive and well and healing, and I've experienced dramatic healings in my own body, as well as having been an instrument to lay hands on others and watch healing take place, sometimes even instantly, sometimes massive, stunning, incredible miracles. I'm just saying we're not seeing the blind healed. I'm not, and I'm certainly not saying that I have the gift of healing. I certainly don't. I wish I did. I wish many did. I wish many ministers had this gift of healing so that God's poor people who are suffering without being healed would be healed. I pray and I wish we'd see more of a gift of healing on whomever God wants to put it. We're not seeing Alzheimer's brethren suddenly healed. We're not seeing stage four cancers and tumors in, in cancer, racked body of, of 100 pounds suddenly healed and the man or, or woman leaping up with sudden new strength and joy. Has the, have those things ever happened in the last 20 or 30 years? Yes, I believe they have. But we're not seeing much of it in the last certainly 10 to 20 years. So please understand my point today is to talk about some of the things we may be missing in our daily lives causing us to see less healings than we could be. I don't believe God's gone to a nursing home or retired. I don't think God has disappeared. I don't think God has lost his powers. Far from it. Far from it. If we're not seeing healing today, it's not God's fault. If you say, come on, Philip, those days of massive, powerful, stunning healings are over, or you imply in any way that we shouldn't be seeing those kinds of healings today, I submit to you that indeed our faith is weak as prophesied for the end time. Our beliefs, positive or negative, our faith, in other words, positive or negative, is what, we'll, is what we will tend to see in our lives. If we really don't believe that amputees can leap up with whole new whole bodies, that the blind can see quickly, powerfully, verifiably, that those dead for several days can be resurrected to a new wonderful life in this life before the, the great resurrection, if we don't believe those things, how can we expect to see anything so stunning as powerful healings again? I believe our God is as strong and powerful today as ever, and we're not seeing His majestic working in our lives, not because He's retired, but there's something missing in us. Neither do I subscribe to the fact or the teaching that healing is just between you and God. I think by one of uh, by the end of today's sermon that uh, you'll certainly understand that Yahweh wants us thinking as one, as one body, coming together as one, and that what happens to the toe does affect the head. And how we're treating one part of the body does hurt the whole body. How we're treating what we consider to be the backside of the body or the armpit affects the whole body. There's a group dynamic going on here that Father in Heaven wants us desperately to learn. And I hope we will learn it, brethren. I really hope we will. But before I get into part two, uh, you know, and continue where we left off, I, I want to say and remind you that I do have, just an aside here, when you're going to my website, if you have an iPod or an iPhone or something like that, you can set it up so that my sermons are automatically downloaded to you and to your iPod. Whenever you wish, you can listen to them that way in the car or whatever. The instructions are on the website, lightontherock.com. You can tell people about that. If this sermon stirs you, or stirs something within you, please tell others because I think we've got to have God's people thinking as a body now, as a body that needs healing itself right now and coming together. We've been through a lot and God is going to help us get through all, all of this. Well, track two. I did make it clear last time, I hope, that indeed faith and obedience are key parts of healing. 
without faith, your chances of being healed are slim or none, or, or next to none, almost none. We have the clear example in Mark 6, verses 4 to 6, where even Jesus himself, it says, could not or did not do many healings, except for a very few in his hometown of Nazareth, for their unbelief. But even with faith, it would be wrong to conclude that every faithful and righteous person will be assured of healing every single time in this life. I pointed out how many righteous people, even ones full of faith, had physical infirmities. Many of them died with an illness. I don't think you can think of a more faithful person in the Old Testament than Elisha. So it's not wrong to conclude that, so it is wrong to conclude that if I just had more faith, I'd be healed. Maybe. But maybe not. It's not always God's will to heal us in this life, no matter how faithful, full of faith and, and righteous you are. I mentioned Elisha dying of an illness, Second Kings thirteen fourteen. I mentioned righteous and faithful Paul, not healed of his thorn in the flesh. And Timothy had often infirmities. Trophimus was left in Miletus sick. I spoke of David, Abraham, and Isaac, and Jacob, all having aging issues of blindness, other issues, not being able to be warm, and so on. All of them have since died, and all of us will die if, if the Christ doesn't return relatively soon. We used to emphasize the role of faith and obedience so much that um, people were often left with huge feelings of rejection, failure, and depression, wondering what on earth they could be doing that was so evil, or how they could be lacking in so much faith when they prayed and fasted and asked God for faith and really thought they believed. And still, their little boy, their little girl, their wife, or their father, or their mother, a loved one, still wouldn't be healed. Remember, even I have lost a little boy. I know the questions from first hand that can be raised in one's mind when healing doesn't come about, when you feel you've repented of any sins, you've, you're, you're living a, a, a life that's pleasing to God, You've been fasting, you've been asking for faith, you're asking others to pray, and, you're, and your little boy still dies. So remember that even the most righteous and the most faithful in the Bible also at times were not healed or couldn't heal others. And so don't hold it too hard against yourself if you're not specifically healed. So don't conclude that if someone is not being healed, someone else, that it's necessarily their fault or their sin or their lack of faith. So often... I hear people go back to faith or sin. Those are parts of the picture, but they're not the entire part of the picture, brethren. I also don't have a lot of time to spend on it today, but I want to say again, scriptures simply do not support the notion that to use physic physicians or physical remedies is to demonstrate a lack of faith in God. Yeshua himself said the sick need a physician. Matthew 9:12. How could he say anything remotely like that if it would have been wrong to use modern medicine or doctors or, or bombs? Or, in fact, the Bible speaks quite often of medicines in a positive way. You know, that uh, a merry heart is like a good medicine and so forth. And bombs and poultices and oil and wine like the good Samaritan who poured it into the man uh, who was beaten up and dressings and even using physicians. <clears throat> However, it is wrong to put all your faith in the doctor or in even, a, even an all-natural remedy that you, this is going to fix you and heal you and you put your faith in an all-natural remedy. That's no better than putting all your faith in a doctor. It's okay to go to doctors. It's okay to have remedies. It's okay to have balms and poultices and oil and wine and all that. But it's wrong to leave God out of the picture or to not put your faith in God. It would be wrong to leave God out of the picture as Asa or Asa, Asa did. We pointed out last time, Second Chronicles 16:11. Asa got sick in his feet, it says, and he sought the physicians and did not seek God. Okay, so, and Asa by that time, if you read the context in Second Chronicles 16, had been demonstrating a pattern of not relying on God. If you read the whole chapter. So that's my stand on it. And yes, I use doctors. And yes, I have regular checkups. And yes, I have colonoscopies. And I'm glad when they snip off a polyp that could have turned into colon cancer. I'm glad when they find that I have a kidney stone. And if, it, if I can't 
it doesn't disappear, I will go and have them uh, try to take it out, blast it out, whatever they do. Faith and obedience are still huge points in healing, but should not be made the sole points. Certainly disbelief or the lack of faith, like I've said, will keep you from being healed. But even with all the faith and obedience in the world, there is no absolute promise that every one of us will be healed every time. Now, I'm just asking the question, even with all of that, we certainly should be seeing far more healings than we're seeing. Again, we have more confidence coming before God when we are obedient. 1 John 3.22 says that if we can come before God and pray and our hearts don't condemn us, verse 22 says, then whatever we ask, we receive from Him because we keep His commandments and do the things pleasing in His sight. And certainly Leviticus 26 and Deuteronomy 28 also do tie obedience to healing as well in many cases, not in every case, as I pointed out. So faithful obedience will lead to less illness and more healings, but even then it's not an absolute promise that God every time should or will heal us. It's just simply not in the Bible that way. Sinning definitely increases the odds of being struck with illness or plagues or of not being healed. Sometimes it's the sin, though, of others or society. David, when he counted Israel... That sin resulted in 70,000 Israelites dying by plague, for example. It wasn't the sin of the 70,000. I've even heard ministers say, well, God probably picked the evil ones in society. There's nothing in Scripture that indicates that. That was David's sin that caused it. God was working with a man who had a shepherd's heart and couldn't stand to see his sheep, his people, suffering because of his sin. In fact, I think at the end he says, strike me, let me be the one, don't, don't, don't hit any more of the sheep. When we realize how much one life or one sin can hurt thousands of others, and vice versa, my sin, my sins, and your sins have affected far more than we think. And I recognize that, brethren, I've repented deeply of that fact. It makes us understand how we must function more as one, as a finely honed body, or as a well-oiled team coming together for one purpose, for the blessing and the praising and the glory of our God in heaven. The sin of someone else's drinking and driving can certainly lead to others being crippled or killed. You know that example, okay? Sometimes it is the sin of society. So, um, I still personally don't think, though, among God's true children... <clears throat> this is a very important point, that time and chance happens to us all. I know that verse is in there in Ecclesiastes. But when my son died, another minister actually said that, well, Philip, time and chance happens to all. And I don't accept that. I believe that when we, I think it happens to all of those who are outside of, of the family of God. But scripture after scripture shows that God knows us so intimately and knows every little thing that happens to us. Isn't it Psalm 139 that says, whether I go up there or down here or sit down or rise up or eat or sleep or wherever I want to do or go, you are there and you know my every thought before I even think it, my every word before I even say it. How then could I possibly think that God turned his back or the guardian angels turned their back for a few seconds and let my son die without their knowledge, without their permission, without their allowing it, knowingly so. So I don't believe that time and chance happens. God's aware of everything and he's doing everything for a purpose. And when you're in the body of Christ and in Christ and in God, as I pointed out in previous sermons, I believe that nothing can happen to you or me without Yahweh knowing it and even feeling it intimately. We're in Him. He knows everything happening to us. If we have faith, if we're obedient, if others are praying for us and we're still being unhealed, then there have to be specific reasons Yahweh has for him that He has in His mind for allowing us to remain ill or even to die. So even in times of suffering, we must remember that all of us are being refined in that suffering. 
Suffering's not a bad thing. It drives us to our knees. Suffering makes us pray more. Suffering makes us be, become united. Have, have you noticed how we come together, even though we're in different groups, at funerals, we come together. Suffering is not a bad thing. And it's also a part of the process of maturing. So neither am I looking for all sufferings to, to stop. I, I, I'm still just asking, given all of this, why aren't we seeing more healings? Now, one more thing has come up since my last sermon. Should you pray for someone you know is not keeping the Sabbath, or quit keeping the Sabbath, or or is badly, badly ill, but is in sin of some kind? Well, several have asked that since my last sermon on healing. Brethren, if I am to err, I want to err or err on the side of mercy and compassion. I certainly need it. James 2.13 James 2.13 says, Judgment is without mercy to those who have shown no mercy. And mercy triumphs over judgment. Okay, maybe you can say it's justice, it's judgment that this person is being, they're getting their just desserts. Well, if we have that kind of unmerciful attitude, it's going to come back and hit us as well. I know you and I will be judged Jesus said in Matthew 7, we will be judged by the same standard that we use on others. So I want to use a great big overflowing scoop of mercy and give lots of latitude and pray fervently for someone's healing, whether they're sinners or not, if I know them, then be dishing out harsh judgment, for I know that I of all sinners surely need God's mercy and your mercy, acceptance, prayer, love, from God and His people. Who among those that Jesus healed, among those whom Jesus and the apostles healed, do you think were 100% righteous? Who among you are 100% righteous? If you're not 100% righteous, and I'm not, should I refuse to pray for someone? Of course I should pray, brethren. I hope, I hope if you've wondered that, you see the difference. How about Naaman, the Syrian leper? Do you think Naaman kept the Sabbath? Do you think he didn't have other gods? Wasn't he healed? In fact, even after he was healed, he asked for Elisha to be understanding of the fact. Read it for yourself in 2 Kings 5, at the end of the chapter, or at least in verses 16 to 19. 2 Kings 5, verses 16 to 19. Elisha says, I mean, um, Naaman says to Elisha, I hope you'll be understanding of the fact that the king of Syria my Lord, he says, is feeble and weak and I have to hold him up when he goes into the, I think it was the temple of Rimon, a false god. He says, I'm not really worshipping that god, but I have to take him into that temple and I have to bow down when he bows down. I hope, I hope that's okay with you. And Elisha gives the surprising answer, go in peace. He did not put the leprosy back on him. So, I mean, if you and I have to be 100% obedient before we can ask for prayers or expect others to be praying for us, there's going to be nobody praying for one another, is there? Not you, not me, nobody. Along those same lines, remember we're told to pray for one another for healing in James 5, 15 and 16. James 5, 15 and 16. I take it that these are well-known passages. I'll read a few in a minute. And if he's committed sins, they will be forgiven. It doesn't say pray that he repent first and then pray for his healing. It says pray for one another for healing and if he's committed sins, they will be forgiven. So whatever you do, don't be holding off prayers for people you believe aren't fully obedient in some aspect of their lives. Ask God to speak to them, to work with them and let God be their judge. But you pray for them, brethren, perhaps more on this later. I hope that helps answer that question. Now, the uh, other question or comment that comes up sometimes is, is the age of miracles not, in fact, over? Some have thought that it ended with the book of Acts. And I don't think Jesus was kidding when he said, I'm going to be with you to the end of the age. And others say that, no, um, healing, in fact, in the Bible is not about physical healing. It's all about spiritual healing, becoming reconciled with God, forgiveness of sin, redemption, and all of that. And there certainly is that part of the meaning 
in parts of the verses in Isaiah 53 and other places, I, you know, I certainly wouldn't deny that. And that certainly is part of the whole picture, part of the whole understanding. And people will often turn to Isaiah 53 and they'll use the Hebrew and all of this to show that the words here mean spiritual healing, not physical healing. So don't uh, start thinking that that's a promise for physical healing. Well, turn with me, if you will, now to Matthew 8. Matthew 8, verses 16 and 17, because Isaiah 53 is actually chosen as as a key text to prove that it's supposed to be only or primarily phys- uh, spiritual healing, spiritual healing, and as a reason why we're not seeing physical healing. I don't buy it. Matthew 8, verses 16 to 17, <clears throat> I don't buy it because I still do see physical healing going on for one thing. When evening came, many of whom were demon-possessed were brought to Jesus, and he drove out the spirits with a word and healed all the sick. This was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet Isaiah, and he now quotes Isaiah 53, verse 4. He took up our infirmities and carried our diseases. And people want to think that that means spiritual healing. Matthew, inspired by God, clearly took Isaiah 53.4 to be referring to also, at least also, physical illness, for that's what he quotes. Too many physically ill Ill people were healed in those days uh, for us to try to claim uh, that 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 it's only uh, about spiritual healing. Uh, There are those who teach that, but there are references to spiritual healing, even being reconciled to God, but that doesn't dissolve or do away with all the instances of stunning physical healing. By the way, I want to say again about praying for someone who's not totally well. One of the most dramatic healings that God allowed me to be part of was a young woman who was not certainly living a life of righteousness. And she had given a birth to a baby prematurely, was five months along. And the doctor even told me that that baby's not going to uh, leave this hospital alive. And I just said, God in heaven, they're challenging you. And I just pray in heaven that you will let these doctors know there's a God in heaven. And God healed both the baby and the mother of a physical condition she had also. Now, I also say to you, brethren, that the church's condition may also be a factor. So I I give that example. You know, let's, let's please be merciful with one another. Anyway, the church's condition may also be a factor why we're seeing less healings. After all, the end-time church is prophesied to be in pretty sad shape. It's hardly conducive to healing when we're described as lukewarm and Laodicean, and and we've locked out our Savior outside his own house. He has to knock at the door. Luke 18.8 says, We'll be low in faith. Will I find faith, or at least implies it? Will I find faith when I I return? And it implies also a low level of, of love. The love of many will wax cold. Remember the point I started with last time, discerning and esteeming the body of Christ. How can we honor one another if our love is getting cold? So lacking faith, lacking love, no matter what we're seeing, brethren, that's not going to help us see dramatic healings. And so, on top of all that, we have an end-time ministry that's prophesied to be living off the flock. Ezekiel 34, I want to read this to you, Ezekiel 34, verses 4 and 5. And also Jeremiah 23 has some similar comments. Ezekiel 34, verses 1 to 10, but I'm going to read verse 4 and 5 in there. Uh, they're, they're acting like the boss, like the lord of the flock, rather than as a the servant. They've forgotten that minister means servant. Ezekiel 34, verses 4 and 5. He says, Woe to you shepherds earlier. Then he says, The weak you have not strengthened. Nor have you healed those who were sick, nor bound up the broken, nor brought back what was driven away, nor sought what was lost. But with force and cruelty you have ruled them. So much force and cruelty, brethren, if I am harsh or stern, I don't want to be. I'd never want to be that. We all can be, or many of us can be, if we let that part come out. Even some of Jesus' apostles wanted to call down fire from heaven and blot out a whole city. Remember when they were tired and that Samaritan city wouldn't let them come in? Minister means servant, not boss. Jesus said, 
he came to be the greatest, he was the greatest servant, and he was very God. Yeshua washed feet. Yeshua, Jesus, healed the sick. I say Yeshua because that's the name he was called by. The English term of Yeshua would be Joshua. I don't know how we get Jesus out of that. That's, that's not English. It's not, I don't know. Yeshua fed the hungry crowds. Yeshua, whom you call Jesus, still ministers to us, still serves us, even though he is, in fact, the coming king of kings. But too many of our ministers want a title. They want to be a senior pastor. They want to be an apostle. They want to be, I don't know, just some title. Jesus said, don't go after titles. Don't be called rabbi. Don't be called father. That's in Matthew 23. And they want to be praised. They want to have the best seats reserved at the Feast of Tabernacles. They want the best parking spots near the doors reserved for them. They don't want to visit people in their homes. They want a new car every two years paid for by the brethren's tithes. You get the picture, brethren? Our Lord walked... And I've been in Israel recently, and even though it doesn't seem like a long distance, a hundred miles is still a hundred miles to walk. You know, if you're coming down from Nazareth, or coming down from the hills, and there's lots of hills in there. I'm telling you, lots and lots of hills in Israel. So, I think that might be part of the picture. Track four, who causes sickness and and illness? And healing. Part of what I'm going to say here in this section is going to rile up some of you, but I think it helps us understand how we should act when we are sick. I hope it doesn't rile you up until you hear it all the way through. Who causes illness? First this. Of course, a lot of illness and problems we bring on ourselves. We let our lives get into a life of stress, wrong diet, Obesity, carelessness, drunkenness, lack of sleep, lack of exercise. Some of those things apply to me. Now, which ones apply to you? We can't blame Yahweh or anyone for those self-induced illnesses. He allows it. We're free moral agents. I preach to myself, too. I can still ask for healing, though, but I probably did bring some of the things I'm suffering on myself. Psalm 39, why don't you read that with me? Psalm 39, verses 7 to 12, is very clear that in this case, sin and iniquity were causing some major health problems for David. And David even asked God to remove the plague from him. Read it for yourself. Psalm 39, verses 7 to 12. Verse 9 says, it was you who did it. David says to God, you who did it. Verse 10 says, Remove your plague from me. I'm consumed by the blow of your hand. So our sin certainly can be a cause, and our illness certainly often is from Yahweh himself. Um, According to many, many scriptures, there are times when wrong living or even sin itself does have a cause and effect sequence. But that's not the whole picture. But I have to believe that we're more likely to see Yahweh being more responsive if he sees us recognizing and appreciating that the bodies he's given us as his dwelling place, as his holy temple, is something we want to cherish and take care of and something we want to make sure we're getting the right diet, the right exercise, and cleaning and, and perfecting and making whole this body we have as much as we can as much as within us. And I'm not talking to those of you who have been victims of accidents or were born with congenital diseases or have, have had, have had uh, or just plain old now and, and feeble. I'm not talking about any of you. I'm talking about those of us who are still young enough to uh, be living right or wrong and causing certain problems. But also last time, that's not my main point. I want to move on to this. Last time I also mentioned I'm not one to go down the road I want to explain this a little further here, that some want to go down, and that is that there are demons of cancer, demons of depression, demons of pain or stroke. Let's talk about that. Scripture is clear that there are demon-possessed people. It's also clear that sometimes casting out demons and healing are put in the same sentence, but if you read the passage carefully, I think it would be separated out. 
to say Satan has the power on his own to inflict illness whenever and wherever he chooses is giving him incredible power, especially if you mean regarding the children of God. Does Satan really have the power to inflict disease and illness and pain and accident and suffering anytime he chooses? Where's Almighty God our healer? Where's Almighty God our defense? Well, I mean, even, even, even to Job, he said, you, God, have, Satan says to God, you have put a hedge around him. And I think God has a hedge around you and me. So keep that in mind as we continue this thought, who causes and brings on illness. First of all, there are clear scriptures that show Satan is sometimes allowed to and does certainly bind people with illness or physical issues many, many times. In Acts 10, verses 38 and 39, it, cutting into the mid-sentence here, uh, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. Healing all who were oppressed by the devil. So Satan can oppress people, and they can be people who need healing. That's clear in that verse. There's another verse in Luke 13, verse 16. <clears throat> but now my question as you read this, is Satan responsible for all illness and all disease? Luke 13, verse 16. This was a woman, I think, deeply bowed over. Jesus healed her on the Sabbath. And then they were taking him to task for that. So he says, so ought not this woman, Luke 13, verse 16. Please turn there with me. <clears throat> I'll wait for you. Luke 13, verse 16. So ought not this woman, being a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan has bound, think of it, he says, for 18 years be loosed from this bond on the Sabbath. Pretty dramatic, isn't it? Pretty dramatic. So, um, anyway, moving on. When, when all of the scriptures are put together, including several we are yet going to read, here's what I think. Here's what I think. Satan is the god of this world. That's what it says in the Bible very clearly. This is his kingdom. Among those that God is not going to call in this age, I think Satan very likely can move at will. But at least among those God is working with, I'm convinced he can do nothing without getting prior approval. There are verses after verse that show God puts a hedge around his people, and Satan can only do what God permits. Job is a great, a great case in point. Satan himself reminds God that Job in Satan's condition is only righteous because God had put a hedge around him, Job 1. But Satan could, only, Satan could do nothing, nothing, until God permitted it. Even then, Yahweh put very specific boundaries on Satan. Now, where on first glance it might seem like healing and casting out demons are one and the same and, and Satan's involved in all of these things. I think as we as we read about things in the Bible, we'll see that, in fact, Satan has to get permission. I believe that since Satan's the God of this world and probably is the one causing illness he, among his own people, he probably has the right to do so. But when it comes to God's children who have been redeemed from the power of Satan by the blood of the Lamb, God's children who are now sealed by the Holy Spirit. Satan can only bind or oppress those whom Yahweh allows him to, like in the case of Job. But who ultimately brought on the trials for Job? Satan or God? Turn with me to Job 42 and verse 11. Job 42 and verse 11. Didn't Satan have to get permission? He did. But who granted the permission? So who ultimately brought on Job's problems? In the end, in wrapping up what had happened to Job and describing what happened in Job 42, the middle part of the verse 11, it says, For all the adversity that Yahweh, that the Lord, had brought upon him. For all the adversity that Yahweh, the Lord, had brought upon him. I thought Satan was the one who brought the boils and the, and the attacks on his children who killed the children and burned the houses and, and stole all the, everything he had, the sheep and everything else. 
for all the adversity that the Lord had brought upon him. Job 42.11. This reminds me at the time when Peter um, warns, uh, when Jesus warns Peter that Satan had asked for him, but that he, Yeshua, or Jesus, was praying for him. That's in Luke 22.31, in case you're not familiar with the example. I think that is a key verse that really helps us understand really helps us understand that Satan cannot do anything to you or your children unless, the children who live with you in your own home at least, unless and until he has permission first from God for whatever God's reasons are. My point is certainly among God's children, Satan has to first ask and receive permission before he can do anything terrible. I'm convinced of that. Then if permission is granted, Satan can inflict disease, but again, only to the limits God allows but who ultimately opens the door. So you have to, how does that make you feel then about God? You see, we've got to learn to deal with that. Also in Exodus 15, verse 26, the commonly quoted verse about God, our healer, Exodus 15, 26, they had just come out of Egypt and, and God's talking to them, if you diligently heed the voice of Yahweh your God, the Lord your God, and do what's right in His sight, give ear to His commandments and keep all His statutes, I, God speaking, or being quoted, I will put none of the diseases on you, which I brought on the Egyptians. For I am the Lord who heals you. We like the last phrase, I am the Lord who heals you. But it's interesting in the, in the sentence before that, that he says, if you obey me, I won't put, I won't put any of these diseases on you. Food for thought, isn't it? Deuteronomy 7.15 says something very similar. Other passages are found in Deuteronomy 28. Second Chronicles 7.15 in that fabulous prayer of Solomon and in the vision, I mean in the vision where, where God is saying, if my people called by my name will humble themselves and, and cry out and seek my face and, uh, and I will, you know, I will hear from heaven. And he goes on saying, I will heal and so forth. Who heals? God will heal. But, but, and he goes on in verse 15 to say, and I won't put these diseases on you. Look at, look at Exodus, Exodus 4.11. Exodus 4.11. This is the time God was talking to Moses. And Moses is trying to get out of having to be the, uh, the, the prophet to go and speak for God. And he says, I, I can't speak. I have a stutter and all of this. Or I, you know. So God says to Moses in Exodus 4.11, something very, very telling along the lines of what we're talking about here. Exodus 4.11. Turn there and look at it for yourself. Who makes one dumb or deaf or seeing or blind? Is it not I, Yahweh? Is it not I, the Lord, who makes one dumb or deaf or seeing or blind? That's a phenomenal verse. Hard verse to really want to read. We like to think Satan does it all. Yahweh was the one who sent plagues in number 16, which killed thousands. Yahweh was the one who sent the, the plague in da David's day, like I said. Yahweh was the one who sent an epidemic in Numbers 11, the end of it. 2 Kings 15.5. 2 Kings 15.5 says, And Yahweh, the Lord, struck the king so he was a leper to the day of his death. Other verses, if you aren't convinced, even, even Nebuchadnezzar and Herod were struck by angels or by God for not giving God the glory. Isaiah 10, 16, 2 Chronicles 21, 14, other places. God was the one who put leprosy on Miriam in Numbers 12. And there's just so many verses that even among God's own people, God was the one who kept certain women from having uh, the ability to bear children. God was the one who closed their wombs, like Sarah, Genesis 21, like Rebecca, that's in Genesis 25, like Rachel, Genesis 30, like Samuel's mom, Hannah. Makes you think, doesn't it? Psalm 113, verse 9 says, He, God, Yahweh, grants the barren woman a home like a joyful mother of children. He closes the womb, and he opens the womb. 
It doesn't mean the person's evil. It didn't mean that Sarah, Rebecca, Rachel, or Hannah were evil. Please don't go there. Please don't. For God's own purposes, He did it. And I have to say personally that certainly among God's children, I just can't imagine Satan having any power at all to cause illness or tragedy unless permission is granted first. Perhaps it could be said that among those God is not working, the people of the world, that Satan may have pretty much a free reign. I don't know. I think he might. It's his world, his age, his society, his kingdom. But among those who are now begotten in the new kingdom of God, I see Satan having no power to inflict problems except by permission granted first by God, as in the case of Job. Again, it's hard to always know why he's doing it, but it drove them to their knees, it drives us to our knees, and that's always a good thing. So here's the dilemma that it leaves us with. How on earth could or would a loving father ever do a thing like that? We say to ourselves, if I had the power to put illness or on, on or off my children, there's no way I would. But we're not God. I too have had a son who wasn't healed and died. I did wrestle with it. Sometimes I still do. It raises a lot of questions. And Paul ultimately answers those kinds of questions by saying, and my paraphrase of what he said, he said, He's the potter, guys, and we're the clay. The potter can do as he wishes with the clay. It's not up to the clay to question. So carnally speaking, that's not satisfying. Until we come to realize that we are his and he is ours. We have to come to rest in him and have the kind of faith that, now listen carefully, have the kind of faith that stays on him and is there whether we're healed or not. It's the kind of faith that allowed Daniel's three friends in Daniel chapter 3, verses 13 to 18. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said in Daniel 3, when they were going to be cast into the fiery furnace if they didn't bow down, they said, Our God is able to deliver us from this fire. But if He chooses not to, we are still not going to bow down to the pagan idol. That is real faith is when you can say, I believe he can. There's no question in my mind he can. Whether he does or not is up to him, and I rest my case and my faith in that. So we learn, therefore, as I said last time, that is how, when we really rest in him, regardless of what's happening, that we can thank him even while we're in chains, chains of illness, chains of pain, or literal chains as Paul and Silas were in. Even while the disease is raging on, while the pain is excruciating, we're learning to praise and thank God for all things, even the pain, even the disease, and in all things, knowing that He has a purpose and a good intention that we may not be able to fully see yet at this time, but we shall see it when it's all said and done. And it is refining us. It is making us pray. It is making us see the things that are more important in life. That's what real faith is about, that we stick with Him even until death if need be, though we hope for things still unseen, even when we don't see the healing. And I think, and as I said last time, as we pray and thank God and praise Him and, and sing praises, even in the problem, even in the change, that our chances of being, or the odds of us being healed then by God dramatically increase. Even as we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, real faith says, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Yeah, I know, you're making me walk through this valley of the shadow of death. But at least your rod and your staff are here to comfort me. We learn to thank him, as I said last time, even before we see the healing, and even if we see death instead. And I think if we all start doing that more, I think we will start seeing more healings. Now that proves our faith, doesn't it? Faith is based on who we know, not on what we see happening. As Yeshua says to Thomas, you believe because you see. Blessed are those who believe without first having to see. As I said last time, I think we will see more healings if we start doing this more often. And if we start admitting that we might need a shot of extra faith, Ask for faith, pray for faith, 
Well, we pray for a job, we pray for a car, we pray for more income, we pray for this and that, a house. How many of us really pray for more Holy Spirit? Really pray for more faith? Pray for more love? I love the story in Mark 9:24, where Jesus asked this man who had asked for healing for his son. He says, do you believe? He says, yes, Lord, I believe. Um, help my unbelief. That's got Philip Shields written all over it. When I'm in pain, when I'm facing a, a, a severe trial, I want to believe I have faith, but then I say, um, but help my unbelief. Give me more faith. I want to have faith. We want to believe. But man, that pain's really strong right now. Help my unbelief. We cry out. We start to praise and sing and thank God even in the pain, even for the pain, knowing that we are growing from spiritual muscle even as the outward man is perishing, as Paul puts it. We still have a lot to grow in, don't we? So like the man in Mark 9.24, Mark 9.24, please help my unbelief. Another question that comes up a lot is... If God allows Satan to bind someone with illness, can Satan heal? God's the healer. But I can I think Satan can make something look like a healing. If Satan's allowed to bind someone with an illness, I think Satan can certainly unbind the person through one of his ministers and look like a genuine healing. And for all intents and purposes and even verifiability would be a healing. Uh but but his ministers come on come off as ministers of light. Remember that in the end times the great Antichrist is gonna have great I mean, the great false prophet is going to have great working powers so impressive that he can call down fire from heaven and probably include things like healing and raising the dead and so forth that it's possible even deceive the very elect. Matthew 24, 14. His powers are from demons. Revelation 16 says that. So demons can also work miracles, presumably even ones that appear to be genuine healings. Having said that, I'm always cautious to claim any healing from Satan lest I be giving credit to Satan that should be to God's glory. So be aware of the possibility that Satan can make it look like a healing. And I would tread, I would just get, I wouldn't even get into that topic. Because Jesus himself gives us a serious warning about accusing, remember when they said that he cast out demons by, by Beelzebub? And he said that's tantamount to the unpardonable sin. So beware of accusing a genuine healing as being a source in Satan. Danger, danger, danger. Like that, uh, who was that guy back in Australia? Danger, 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 you know, uh, the the naturalist. Anyway, brethren, we have to be so careful that we don't go go there uh, too much. I think Satan can make it look like a healing. Having said that, that's all I want to say about it. Now, let's move on. Let's move on now on track five. Uh, last time we started talking about several points that we can immediately start applying. And point one was to start thanking God even before we see the healing. Thank God before. Uh, knowing he's working his purpose and his time and his way, we can thank him because that act demonstrates our faith that we're in his hands and whatever he wants to do is fine with us and we trust his timing whether we live or even whether we die. We all know healing is a done deal whether now or in the resurrection. Timing, the when of it, is his. So we thank him for it. And as we act act as if the healing's already been taken taken place, uh, by being thankful in all things and all and for all things, I talked about that a lot. And we spoke of Yeshua thanking Abba for having already heard him, even while Lazarus was still dead. Uh, we 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 talked about Peter and Silas thanking God in, in the jail. We talked about the uh, thanking God for having multiplied the fish and the loaves while there are probably still only five and two there in front of him. Now let's continue the second point we started last time about the. One big, huge reason I think we're not being healed is because we're not discerning the body of Christ. 1 Corinthians 11, please turn there with me, in verses 27 to 32. 1 Corinthians 11, verses 27 to 32. God's Word specifically says we're seeing people going unhealed because the church is not discerning or esteeming the body of Christ enough Meaning, I don't think, I don't think it just means the body, the literal body of Jesus, Yeshua, the Christ. Scripture after scripture says the body of Christ is the church. How we esteem and discern one another. 1 Corinthians 11 verses 27 to 32, Therefore whoever eats the bread and drinks the cup of the Lord, at the Passover now, 
in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord, but let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner drinks judgment on himself, not discerning the Lord's body. Not discerning the Lord's body. For this reason, many are weak and sick among you and many sleep. I know you can read that a couple of different ways and say, no, he's talking about the way we take Passover and therefore God's mad at us and he's going to... I think it's much more than that. I think in the way it's in the, in the Greek here, I think it's we're talking about not discerning the Lord's body. <clears throat> I think that's tied very clearly then to verse 30. For this reason, not discerning the Lord's body. Many are weak and sick among you, and many sleep or die, means. Okay? 1 Corinthians 11 speaks of not discerning the Lord's body. We know from many scriptures that means the church. God resides in us by the Holy Spirit. Colossians 1.18, Colossians 1.24, 1 Corinthians 12.27. Other places talk about us being the temple of God's Holy Spirit, where God lives. Jesus even said in John 17 that, the Father and I will come and live in you. Are we getting it, brethren? Whether I, in other words, our bodies then become, and that since we are now in Christ and in God, and we are a part of His body, since I'm a part of His body, think about this carefully now. If I step or smash your toe real hard with a hammer, or step on it real hard, or kick you in the stomach, but I'm really nice to your head and your face, you're going to think I'm not being very nice to you if I smash your finger or run, uh, you know, torture your, your fingernails or something. You're going to think I'm not very nice to you. Are we getting it? Whether I mistreat you or honor you, I'm treating God's presence with that disrespect or honor. I also am treating Jesus himself that way. That's what Jesus teaches us in Matthew 25 when the nations are gathered before him and he says, whatever you did unto the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. He takes personally what you're doing to one another. That's why he says to Paul on the way to Damascus, Paul, Paul, why are you persecuting me? What have I done to you? Paul probably was thinking, wait a minute, I'm not doing anything to you. Yes, you are. These are my people. They're my body. They're parts of my hand, my toe, my fingers, my my organs, my kneecap, whatever. That's me you're persecuting. Are we getting it? Whatever Paul was doing to the brethren, beating them, imprisoning them, Paul was doing to the Christ, since they were the body of Christ. So whomever we come to despise, or whomever we come to honor in the body, we're doing that to the Christ, the anointed one. That's what Christ means. Those people may be in spiritual prisons, may be spiritually naked, but the way we treat one another is the way the king says we're, he feels like we're treating him. And so actually the least brethren, the most despised brethren, the poorest brethren, the weirdest brethren, if he has God's spirit, or she does, is Jesus Christ is part of the body of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> That's why so many times over the years, I've even begun my sermons by saying, Good morning, Jesus Christ. Good morning, Father in heaven. Because we are his body, the body of Jesus Christ. And when I speak to you, I'm speaking to him. And when I treat you a certain way, I'm treating him that way. He identifies with every part of his body, just like you do. Every part. Back to Paul, therefore many of you sick, and many sleep, or die. <clears throat> Brother, I hope you're getting it. I can't escape the fact that I feel Yahweh wants us to learn this, and learn it quickly, if we were to see more healings in the church. Start respecting and honoring Him by respecting and honoring every single person in the church. Quit despising anybody in the church. Turn now to Isaiah 58. Isaiah 58, as you go there, I want to ask you, as you turn there, 
For whom would you not fast for if he or she was badly ill? Or would you just smugly conclude that God himself must have smitten them for their many sins? When I asked myself that question, I had to leave the sermon for a while and go repent because there were people that I had to, in my honesty to myself, say I probably have a hard time really truly with my heart fasting for that person. And until I could say I will and I would fast for them, I hadn't worked on the sermon. I hope you'll follow the admonition because I would that would be doing it to Jesus Christ. Another, oh, it's so easy for us to say, well, he, that person is not a part of the body of Christ. Well, beware of that. Who are you, the judge? Isaiah 58, verses 6 to 10 says something similar. Isaiah 58. Is not this the fast I've chosen to loose the bonds of wickedness to undo? When we're fasting, this should be the effect of it. To undo the heavy burdens, to let the oppressed go free, that you may break every yoke. Is it not to share your bread with the hungry? We have hungry brethren in Kenya, brethren. I really, really appreciate those of you who are helping us out over there. Really do. More importantly, they really do. And that you bring to your house the people who are poor, who are cast out. And when you see the naked, that you cover him. Some of us are emotionally naked, spiritually naked. Some of us need some clothing, brethren. Some of us need you to be willing to clothe us. And not hide yourself from your own flesh. Because we're one body. We're members of one another. How can we hide from our own flesh? Romans 12, 5 and 4 and 5 says that you are members of one another. Then your light shall break forth like the morning. When you fast that way, then your healing, verse 8, Isaiah 58, 8, then your healing shall spring forth speedily and your righteousness shall go before you. The glory of Yahweh shall be your rear guard. And then you will call, and Yahweh will answer, and you shall cry, and he will say, I here I am. We're going to have answered prayer, in other words, brethren. We're going to have answered prayer, finally, in other words. And then you shall call, and the Lord will answer. And he shall cry, and he'll say, here I am, verse 9. If you take if, this will happen if, you take away, if you take away the yoke from your midst, the pointing of the finger. What? The pointing of the finger. We must stop the finger pointing. The gossip. We must stop hiding ourselves from our own flesh. We must stop talking badly about one another. We must stop the disrespect to Jesus Christ when we gossip about a minister, about, about another brethren. Brother, brother, about other brethren, about that group over there. God teaches us we're supposed to honor all people without condition. Part of, I think, the way we disrespect Christ's body is because we've accepted a false teaching from the world that honor has to be earned. Philip, what are you talking about? Well, brethren, that was quite a revelation to me. The Bible does not say honor has to be earned. Honor your father and mother if they're good fathers and mothers. No, it doesn't say that, does it? Wives submit to honor, respect, and some translations even say reverence your own husbands as you would to the Lord Himself. doesn't say if they're good husbands, does it? Neither does it say husbands love your wives as your own bodies as Christ loved the church and gave Himself for it. He doesn't say if your wife deserves that kind of honor and love and respect. In service, there's no condition there. We're to honor the king, First Peter 2.17, who was Nero at the time that was written without condition. I hope that makes you think we're to honor one another. When was the last time you honored the king, the leader of your country? I have a hard time with the leader of my country right now because he's doing things I think are not very good to the country. I'm supposed to honor him and pray for him. And I'm beginning to, brethren, even though it's hard, because that's what Yahweh says. But certainly we are to honor Yeshua, shouldn't we? When we see any part of his body anywhere, it's a humble person who's respectful and honoring of all people. I admit, I've got a long way to go yet there. It's not something I was born with. 
it's, it's something I am working on, repenting of all the time, the dishonoring I give people in and out of the body of Christ. It's got to stop. I've got to stop. We've all got to stop. We've got to respect and take care of and look out for every everybody in, in and out of the church, but especially the members of the church. Romans 14, verse, verses 1 to 4 are really telling. I want you to read it sometime. Romans 14, 1 to 4. We are to accept and receive the weak, refusing to despise one another. Why? Because in end of verse 3, Romans 14, 3, for God has received and accepted him. Received can also be translated many places as accepted. For God has accepted him. So why, why can't we accept somebody? Verse 4 says, Who are you to judge another servant? To his own master he stands or falls. Indeed, he, God, will make him stand. You don't turn your back on someone who sits down at your table because you think he's a whatever. If he has God's spirit, you talk to that person and you let the judgment be God's judgment. Are we getting it? Paul teaches us under inspiration to not just quit despising one another, but start helping each other stand. Let's prop each other up. Let's pray for one another, encourage one another, cheer one another on. Let's come together as a body, one body, as a well-oiled team. Quit judging one another, especially in these matters of righteousness, brethren. Especially in these matters. Why aren't we seeing more healings? Because we keep kicking the Savior in the groin, as it were, when we despise each other. In a nutshell, let's wrap up point two by saying, treat every human with utmost respect, especially those in the church, as you would treat the King of Kings himself. That includes the brethren who despise, whom you, you and I might despise for one reason or another. That includes that, that we might typically or readily despise. That's got to stop. That includes the folks in that fellowship over there. That includes the members of an enemy tribe. There's so much tribalism among you who are hearing this in Africa where the Maasai don't like the Luo or the Luo don't like the Maasai or the Kikuyu and vice versa. Or how about the Tutsi and the Tua and the Hutus? We've got to get over all that. The sick in the church are remaining unhealed because not because of some individual sin but because I believe that we as a group haven't learned this. Malachi 2 says, Malachi 2 says also, brethren, verses 8 and 9, that God uh, God uh, prophesied that there, there'd be this contempt. And then later on in Malachi 2, he says he hates divorce. That's another way that we're despising a brother or a sister. When we divorce a husband or wife who has God's spirit, especially when it's a divorce that doesn't have any grounds for divorce. If it has grounds for divorce, that's another reason altogether. I'm not saying anything about that. But if there's no grounds for divorce, and certainly, you know, I, there are many, many people who made a happy marriage, even though there were grounds of divorce, they worked on it. The person repented who had who made the grounds for divorce, and they came together. I'm not saying you have to, but I'm saying, but certainly don't divorce for no grounds. That's kicking Jesus in the groin. Our marriages, the number of divorces going on in the church, all of that, brethren, all of that's got to be something we see that Yeshua just simply can't be happy with. So I call on ministers everywhere. Start speaking out on divorce. Speaking out on marriage a lot more strongly. Love one another as I've loved you. Let's certainly do that with our husband or our wife. If we can bless and pray for our enemies, certainly we can do that for our husband or wife, can't we? Can't we, brethren? So that was point number two, was to honor all, esteem and regard the body of Christ as being the Messiah himself. Treat every single man, woman, and child as you would the king himself. And I think when we start to discern the body of Christ like that, we are going to see more healings in the church. I really believe that. Okay, the last point coming up here. Okay, the last point, James 5, verses 14 to 16. Another big reason why we can see and how we'll see more healings happening is it says right here in James 5, verses 14 to 16, Is anyone among you sick? Let him call the elders of the church. Let him pray for him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the sick. Faith is certainly very important. And the Lord will raise him up. And if he's committed sins, he will be forgiven. Confess your trespasses to one another. Because we all have them. Because we all have them. And this is, point, this is my, my third major thing we can do now to 
change things in the church, have more healings, pray for one another that you may be healed. I love the way it's worded here. Pray for one another so that you can be healed. I would ask it this simply. Are you praying as frequently, as fervently for others as you would for yourself if you were to find out you had pancreatic cancer or your husband had it or your wife had it or you were going to be laid off or your child has been hit by a car or your little boy, your little girl is having to have surgery. That's the way we should be doing it. Praying and fasting like we would if it was our own our own kin, our own flesh and blood. When was the last time you actually fasted for someone else's healing who was outside of your own family? It's a trick question in a way because we are family, aren't we? Even the guy went right across the country. When we're in God's church, we are, we are family. David said when his enemies were sick, he afflicted his soul and fasted. Psalm 35, Psalm 35, 13 and 14, As for me, when they were sick, my clothing was sackcloth. I humbled myself with fasting. My prayer would return to my own heart. I paced about as though they were my friend or brother. I bowed down heavily as one who mourns for his mother. What an incredible passage, an incredible example. We're to pray for our enemies and bless those who curse you and love our enemies. He did this for his enemies. Job said the same in Job 30, verse 25. Jesus teaches us to pray for those who spitefully use us. You, Matthew 5:44. How about some fervent prayer for one another? We're to weep with those who weep. And number 16 is quite, to me, one of the most powerful examples of this that I can think of. Number 16, this was a story when earlier in the chapter God had swallowed up Korah and his mob with him and the 250 elders were struck by fire and the 250 elders of the nation who had come to rebel against Moses and Aaron And if you read the whole story slowly in number 16, it looks like there came a point when the crowd, the mob wants to stone them. Uh, They're so mad at Moses and Aaron. I mean, they want to stone Moses and Aaron. And God says to Moses and Aaron, verse 41. Yeah, let's pick up there. The next day, all the congregation, number 16. I'm in number 16, okay, folks? Number 16, verses 41 to 50. The next day, the congregation of Israel, all the congregation, complained against Moses and Aaron, saying, You've killed the people of of Yahweh. Now it happened when the congregation had gathered against Moses and Aaron that they turned toward the tabernacle of meeting. Suddenly the cloud covered it, and the glory of Yahweh appeared. Then Moses and Aaron came before the tabernacle of meeting. Now you'd think if they saw the cloud, they they had half a brain cell working part-time. They would have thought that we're going against God here. But anyway, they didn't. Yahweh spoke to Moses saying, Get away from this congregation that I may consume them in a moment. But Moses and Aaron didn't. They fell on their faces instead. Moses said to Aaron, Take a censer, put fire in it from the altar, put incense on it, take it quickly to the congregation, make atonement for them, for them. These people want to stone us. You pray for them. Make atonement for them. For wrath has gone out from from Yahweh, from the Lord. Wrath has gone out from Yahweh. The plague has begun. Now, would you run into a plague from God? Then Aaron took it as Moses commanded and ran into the midst of the assembly and already the plague had begun among the people. I'm in number 1647. So he put the incense and made atonement for the people. He... And now verse 48 to me is so moving. And he stood between the dead and the living, so the plague was stopped. Why was it stopped? Because somebody prayed for, somebody stood in the breach. And until God had stopped it already, 14,700 had been killed. This was a massive uprising. And Aaron runs right into the middle of the group. Stands between the dead and the living. So the plague was stopped. 
brethren, when are we doing that for each other? Moses did that for the whole nation again after the gold, after the golden calf incident. I'm going to show you on the Day of Atonement that when Moses came down and said, God has atoned your sins, that traditionally was the Day of Atonement. Or right just before it, I'll talk about it coming up. Psalm 106, verse 23 describes that moment. Psalm 106, verse 23, Therefore, God said that he would destroy them had not Moses, his chosen one, stood before him in the breach to turn away his wrath, lest he, God, destroy them. Moses stood before him in the breach. God has said, Moses, get out of the way. I'm going to, I'm going to blast them all out of here. I'll make a new nation out of you. And in my paraphrase of it, Moses basically said, if you're that kind of God, I want no part of you. Blot me out. Blot my name out, but don't blot them all out. When have we prayed for people who wanted our death like that? I know I haven't. I'm starting to. Will you join me? Ezekiel 22, verses 29 to 31 Ezekiel 22, verses 29 to 31, God says He'll pour out His judgments on the land. This is a prophecy for us coming ahead of us, brethren, because there were no people standing in the gap. Ezekiel 22, verses 29 to 31, The people of the land have used oppressions, committed robbery, and mistreated the poor and needy, and they wrongfully oppressed the stranger. Don't be so much against illegal immigration or strangers that you ever oppress them, brethren. Or else you have Almighty God to contend with. I want strong borders. But if they're here, God says to love everybody. So I sought for a man among them who would make a wall and stand in the gap before me on behalf of the land that I should not destroy it. But I found no one no one. What a, what a travesty. What an insult to our generation. Therefore, I have poured out my indignation on them. When was the last time you prayed for President Obama? Prayed for him? I'm no fan of him, but my Creator tells me to pray for those in authority and to honor the King. When was the last time you prayed for America itself or for your country, Australia? When was the last time you prayed for them? Or Kenya, or Canada, whatever country you live in, to stand in the gap before me on behalf of the land that I should not destroy it. Remember, in the end, God goes out against the whole world. When was the last time we prayed for one another with the same fervency that we would pray for our own flesh and blood with fasting and prayer and crying and beseeching God fervently? When was the last time you truly on your knees sighed and cried for the abominations in the land before God so that God may put a mark on your forehead and spare you and me? That's in Ezekiel 9, verses 4 to 7. When was the last time we prayed for the sick, the infirm, with as much zeal as we would ourselves or others we love very deeply who have been, if we've been told they have cancer? When we pray for one another, the wording from Yahweh is that you may be healed. I like to picture this when I pray for you as presenting you, raising you up to the throne of grace of the Almighty, saying, God, I lift up my friend. I lift up someone who considers me his enemy, but he is my friend and doesn't know it. I lift him or her up to you for your healing. I want to stand in the gap between the you and the land. I know we're evil in this nation, I know we're doing things on, that make you unhappy. I know we're killing millions and millions of unborn babies. I know we're doing all these horrible things in this land. Father, have mercy on us. When was the last time you prayed that prayer? Or do you pray that God come quickly and, and blow off these people who are doing all these things? There's something very interesting about praying for others. In Job's case, when, you know, Job's blessings 
didn't really even start until he did that one thing. In Job 42, God tells Eliphaz in verse 7, and God says to Eliphaz, My wrath is aroused against you and your two friends. So Eliphaz might, Eliphaz might have been the, uh, the leader. For you have not spoken of me what is right, as my servant Job has. Now therefore take for yourselves seven bulls, seven rams, and go to my servant Job, and offer up for yourselves a burnt offering. By the way, just because uh, the, the things that Eliphaz and others said are in the book of Job in the Bible, it doesn't mean that everything they said is biblical or correct. Be careful you know who's talking there, okay, when you read the book of Job. God says what you've said about me is not correct. But anyway, verse 9, So Eliphaz the Temanite and Bildad the Shuhite and Zophar the Namathite went and did as the Lord commanded them, for the Lord had accepted Job. Verse 10, Job 42.10, And the Lord God restored Job's losses when he prayed for his friends. Indeed, the Lord gave him twice as much as he had before. When? When he started praying for his friends. If these are friends. I wonder what Job's enemies were like. This is intercessory prayer, the kind of prayer that probably has far more impact with Yahweh than almost any other kind of prayer we can offer. For it's totally selfless. It's standing in the gap kind of prayer. It's being there for your brother when he needs it. I remember when my son died. And at first I didn't want anybody around. But after about half an hour I started thinking, well boy, this is terrible. And I called my best friend, another minister, four hours away. And you know, four hours later, my doorbell was ringing. And my best friend had immediately left, had immediately grabbed some things and thrown in the car and come up. That's a friend. And they prayed with us. And they stood in the gap. And they strengthened us. And they stood by us. I prayed many times, and I pray now again that God bless them for that. Brethren, we have to be a person who is a paracletos, someone coming alongside, standing beside them. I'll talk about that in another sermon because I'm out of time. But brethren, I am out of time. So much more to say about intercessory prayer. That's a whole topic by itself. But please, point number three, make sure we are definitely praying for one another, not just as a checklist that we cross off, but with our whole heart in it. That we pray with our whole heart for people, even those who are our enemies, as if it were our own flesh and blood. Brethren, please, let's all do this. Let's come together as one. Let's stop the talking back and forth, the pointing of the finger, the dishonoring of Jesus Christ as we dishonor one And let's honor Him by honoring one another. Let's love Him by loving one another. And we will see healings begin to come about again in much more frequency. Thank you, brethren, for your time with me. And I love you, and I hope you love me. And let's come together, and God take care of you. In Jesus' name, this is Philip Shields, your brother. Amen.